Good morning, everyone. Morning. Why is everyone so sad? This morning? What? Tired, sad, what's going on? <laughs> Far out, I see, you know, tired faces, and um, I'm hoping everyone's good. Good? Everyone's great? Yeah. yeah. How about we do something a little bit different? How about we, we say hello to one another, we, you know, give each other a hug and say, hey, I'm happy you're here. And uh, that's it. Stand up, say hello to one another. Because if not, everyone's going to be falling asleep. The lights off. Amen. Amen. All right. See, now everyone's awake. Perfect. Perfect. Everyone's smiling. So. That's exactly what I want. I want everyone to be happy and smiling. So good morning once again. And look, this morning we're going to be talking about seizing opportunities for 2024. Now we're starting a new year. Um, but the question I've got for you guys is the following. And, and just tell me uh, randomly what you're doing. So tell me one thing that you're going to do this week. One thing. Enrique, what are you doing this week? Oh Give me one. Just one, Give me one. Oh my goodness. I got so many things. Well, give me one. I only want one. All right. I uh, clean my house. You're going to clean your house. Rocio, is there anything particular you're doing this week? One thing. Just the one. Um, cleaning the house. Cleaning the house as well? All right. What about what are you doing this week that's really important for you? Or that you think it's important that you want to do? Just one. Okay. I, I, will, I will be upgraded to course of English. Oh good, you're, so you're gonna, you're gonna register to the new course, great. What are you doing? Cleaning the house. Only one, <laughs> cleaning the house, all right, that's it. Yeah, don't rub it in. What about you, sister, what are you, what are you gonna do this week? One thing. Yeah, yeah just one thing. Um, I do many things. I only want one, only one. Only one. Only one. Preparing my house. <laughs> All right, preparing the house. Yeah. So I think a lot of us have something in common. Jason, what are you doing? One thing you're doing this week. <laughs> Apart from playing games. <laughs> One thing. Help mom. Help mom, okay. Uh, Allison, okay. what are you doing? Prepare for uni. Prepare for uni, all right. Now, seizing opportunities, okay, for 2024. But you know, uh, we are going to be talking about this today. However, we're also, next week, we're going to talk about who you say you are for this 2022. So today, seizing opportunities. Next week, who you say you are in 2022. Then in February, we're going to go for a nine-week series entitled Conquer 2024. And I want you to watch this. at throughout the next weeks how to conquer every single one of those things and it's very important that we remember that we, we go through circumstances difficulties how do we conquer through them how do we conquer um, you know fear how do we conquer um, you know the, uh, discouragement so we're gonna go through a whole bunch of those which will take us for nine weeks all the way to Easter okay so and every single one of us struggles with these things so we're going to look at that but today we're going to start seizing opportunities and i want us to begin by reading again from the book of scripture from the book of ephesians chapter 5 verse 15 to 20 and i want you to help me read together as we read and the word of god says the following we just read it but let's read it again it says look carefully then how you walk not as unwise but as wise making the best use of the time because the days are evil therefore do not be foolish but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. But be filled with the Spirit, 
addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again, Lord, because you want to remind us, Father, that this year, this new year that we're starting, and this new month of January, Father, that you have things for us. You have opportunities for us, and we need to be able to seize them. You're reminding us that we're not to be foolish in the way we walk, foolish in the way we talk, foolish in the things that we do and say, but rather that we are smart and that we make the most of every opportunity. Father, I ask that you put words into my mouth that are a blessing to my brothers and sisters. And may it be you, Father, speaking. May it be the Holy Spirit touching our hearts and our minds for us to understand what the message that you have for us this morning is. We pray this in your mighty name, Jesus. Amen. So let us dissect a little bit about this passage that we just read. And let's put it into perspective. Now, we've all spoken about what we're doing this week. Or several things, or one thing that we're doing in particularly. But let me tell you that God has numbered each person's days. In other words, it means that we have a limited time here in this place that we call Earth. You know, our name or our number may be called any minute. And this is why it is so important that whatever we do, and whichever way we do it, we do it for God because it is a gift of life that he has given us. And we need to use this life for his honor and glory to do the will of God. So we can't be just wasting our times, wasting our opportunities by, by not doing what God is asking us to do. We need to be able to seize every opportunity. And also we need to live in a way that is according to his will. The problem is that we're living our lives according to my will, the way I want to do it, the way I want to run things, the way I want to run my own life. And let me tell you that it's not about me, it's about God and his will. And his will is laid out as a guideline, and the guidelines that we find, we find them in the Bible. You may be thinking to me, I don't know what God wants. I don't understand what is purpose of me coming to church every Sunday. I don't know. Well, let me tell you, you don't know because you're not reading your Bible. And that's where we begin to seize opportunities because we start reading. We start listening and seeing what God wants you to do. And just as a person gets drunk with wine, for example, and, and all of a sudden they lose the inebriation of their life the same way we have to do with the Holy Spirit and surrender our lives to Him and let God guide us. The problem is that we don't want to surrender our lives to Him. And that's where we start facing difficulties and we start wasting time and not seizing those opportunities. We're here for a reason, we're here for a purpose. And when I say here, I don't just mean a church, I mean wherever we spend time in, we're there for a purpose. We just spoke about inviting people to church. What's so hard about saying to someone, hey, why don't you come to church with me? You know, you've got friends that perhaps are going through difficulties and they may tell you, you know, I don't know what's happening in my life and I'm struggling. What's stopping you from telling them, hey, why don't you come to church with me on Sundays? And tell them, look, it's not a change of religion. It is not a change of church. But it is a relationship that perhaps you don't have with Jesus Christ. And perhaps it is an opportunity, especially now as we begin 2024, to engage in that relationship with Jesus. But it's up to us. Or do we miss out on the opportunity of inviting someone or talking to someone about Jesus because we're too focused on me. We're too focused on what I want. So this afternoon... I want us to focus in two verses, verse 15 and verse 16, where it states the following. And if you can help me read it out loud. And the word of God says, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. First of all, look carefully how you walk, how you live, how you talk. 
So I want you to think about the way that you behaved last year. The way that I behaved last year. The way I walked last year. The way I talked last year. The things I did. The things I said. Was I wise or was I foolish? Question is, were you wise or were you foolish? And he goes on to say, making the best use of the time. Did you make use of the time wisely? Were you able to surrender your life to God and give him everything and honor him through everything that you did? And he goes on to say, because the days are evil. Now, look at, watch the news. All we see on the news is death, destruction, death, pain, suffering. That's all we hear. That's all we see. The days are evil. Now, God didn't say that we weren't going to be in the middle of all that. On the contrary, he knows that. That's why he's telling us that we need to be careful how we live. Right? And not only how we live, but also the fact that we need to make the most of every opportunity that we have. To honor Him. To glorify Him. And how do I do that, Carlos? First of all, you come to church. Second, have that relationship with Him. Have that intimacy with God through the reading your Bible, praying every day, inviting people. Let me change it. Don't invite people to church. Invite people to Christ. That should make it easier for you. Invite people to Christ. That's why next week's message is called... Who do you say you are? Because we say that we're Christians, but we don't behave like that. We say that we are Christians and we behave completely opposite to what Christ is or who Christ is. Now, Paul is calling in this text uh, on the disciples of Jesus in the city of Exodus to walk in a manner worthy of their call. Now, you're here because God has brought you here. You know, you, you play the guitar, you play the, the piano, the drums, and you serve at church for a reason. It wasn't just random. God knew that you would be doing this. But how are you doing this? Are you doing it worthy of being called a Christian? Or do you do it just for pleasure? Do you do it just to show off? Do you do it because, you know what, there's nobody else to do it and I'll do it? Or do you know that God has called you for a purpose? And that purpose of you playing the drums, playing the music, preaching, sharing, serving, it, there's a purpose behind it. And the purpose is that other people come to Christ through your example. Through the fact that you are living wisely, you are walking wisely. Now, did you, and, and more importantly, that we're walking in unity as a church as a community the, the worst thing we can do as a community or as a church is that everyone's you know doing their own thing but we're not united and did you know that in the book of Eph Ephesus it's the only chapter in particular this one that in the New Testament that the word unity not united but unity is mentioned in the New Testament let us read and I'll give you the examples. All right. Ephesus chapter 4, verse 3. Verse, excuse me? Eph Ephesians. Ephesians, I'm sorry. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3. And it says the following. It says, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Wow. That we have to maintain the peace of the, or the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. How sad is it when we're arguing with one another, when we're jealous of one another, when we're not supporting one another? There's no unity there, and there's no peace there. And one more, it says in Ephesians chapter 4, 13, it says, Until we all obtain the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness in Christ, of Christ, we need to be his image. We need to use Jesus as an example. But let me ask you this. Are we an example to other people? Are we a good example to other people? Do when people look at us, do they say, well, there's a good Christian over there. You know, 
I aspire to be like him because he's aspiring to be like Jesus. Or do people see us and they think, oh my goodness, if that's what a Christian is like, I don't want to be like that. Or when we come to church and we're arguing with one another and we're causing troubles and issues with one another, issues that perhaps don't exist, are we showing the unity in the spirit of God? No, we're not. It says there that we are one. And it describes Christianity in several, in several ways. And this is very important for us to be able to seize opportunities this 2024. And the first thing is that we as a collective, we as a church must be, must be one body. Say it with me. Can you please help me? One body. Okay, now what does it mean? It means that one body made up of believers everywhere. Not just here, but everywhere. Every Christian everywhere is one body. Yeah, we're not separate entities. We're one body. And Romans 12 tells us the following. It says, and, and uh, help me read it, please. It says the following. It says, for as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, the, through many, though many, are one body in Christ and individual members one of another. So in other words, we're one body and each of us has a different function. Imagine if my foot wanted to be a hand, or if my hand wanted to be my foot, it wouldn't work. Or if my mouth, if I try to hear with my mouth, I can't do that because it has its own function. We as a church are one body with all, with different uh, functions. Through teaching, through preaching, through worship, through serving. Hey, so many functions, okay? That's one thing that we need to be. First of all, in order to be able to seize every opportunity. The other thing that we need to have is, we all need to be is in, help me please, in one spirit. Now, one spirit who indwells in each believer. Now, who indwells? The Holy Spirit lives in us. But we can't be one or one body if the Holy Spirit does not live or indwell in each of us. Romans 8 tells us, and it says the following. It says, you, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. In, if, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. And I love that. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. And this is so serious that God is telling us that we may say that we're Christians and we may say that the Holy Spirit is in us, but if we behave otherwise, it says that we don't belong to him. There needs to be a change from within out. Not from out to within, but within out. The other thing is the fact that as a church and as a collective, we are one body, you know, we have one spirit inside of us or indwelling in us, but also, we also need to have um, one hope. One hope, which is the promise to, the, to return to take, that Jesus Christ is returning to take his followers to heaven. That's the hope that we have this 2024. It doesn't matter whether we die tomorrow, whether we die today, or whenever that we have one hope in him that he will return that's a promise that he's going to return to take his followers to heaven to take you and i with him we need but if we don't believe this then can't we really call ourselves followers of jesus the word of god tells us the following we find this in the book of ephesians as well and it says the following who is the, Jesus who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possessions of it to the praise of his glory. So we are heirs. We're going to collect an inheritance. But only those who are in him or belong to him will be able to do this. Now also as a collective, in order for us to be able to seize opportunities, properly seize opportunities, we need to have and need to be in one 
Lord. Oh, Carlos, but you know, my job is really important. You know, uh, my car is really important. Or oh, my personal belongings are more, excuse me, no, one Lord. He's more important than anything else. One Lord, Jesus Christ, <coughs> bless you, who has redeemed us by his blood. Nothing else, no one else. No other entry point. There's no other connection to the Father but through Jesus who has redeemed us through and by his blood. One Lord. The problem is, though, that we're, we're too focused on my wallet, my strength, my knowledge. You know, I, I believe in my own strength. I believe in my own, what I know. It's not like that. We need to put God first. We need to put our Lord first. Because he has redeemed us. So one Lord. But we also need to have one, uh, one more. In him, we have redemption through his blood and forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Now, uh, it says here, according to the riches of his grace. His grace is so abound that in spite of the fact that we were a train wreck, sin-filled and, and full of trespasses, and committing all these different things against him, according to the riches of his grace, with his grace abound and his mercy and his love towards us, that he has blessed us um, with, or redeemed us with his blood. One more. Corinthians. In Christ, is Christ divided? Is Christ divided? As a church, are we divided? As a group of people who believe in Jesus, are we divided? Well, you know what, Carlos? The Spanish group is here. The English group is there. The Kensington over there. Are we divided? No, we're supposed to be one. We are one. That's why the question is posed in Corinthians. Is Christ, Christ divided? No, he's not. Was Paul crucified for you? No, he wasn't. Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? No, you were baptized in the name of Jesus. We are one, one Lord, no other. We also need to have, and I want to skip Peter as well, I want to skip it, one faith, one faith. And that faith is in our Lord Jesus Christ, once for all delivered to the saints. Who are the saints? You and I, according to his love, mercy, his redemption for us. Jude 3 tells us the following and says, um, <clears throat> Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Right? We need to be sharing and reminding ourselves what Jesus has done for us. It says, for us to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. It was for you and I. For you and that we need to have one faith. One more. One baptism. Referring primarily to the baptism of the Spirit. When you accept Christ into your heart and you start feeling that change come through. That's the change of the Holy Spirit within you. A change of who you were and who you are in Christ. Romans tells us the following. And it says, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ, Christ Jesus, were baptized in his death? That's when we were baptized. And he goes on to say, we were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. So when Christ and we too, those of us who believe in him, we're also to be resurrected or raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. 
That means that you and I, only if we believe. And you may be saying to me, Carlos, what does that have to do with seizing opportunities? Well, my brother and sister, it is your time to seize every single one of those things through Jesus Christ. Don't waste your time. Don't waste your opportunity. Well, Carlos, but I've been a Christian for 50,000 years. Well, let me tell you, my brother, that, you know, you could be inside this building or inside the garage and you won't turn into a car. You need to truly become a son of God and truly believing in him by having, by believing and being one body. you having one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And also, and also, one the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the Heavenly Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. One Father. We need to acknowledge that God is the Father. And Matthew tells us the following. Malachi, my, my, my Malachi chapter 2, verse 10 tells us the following. Have we, all, have we not all one Father, creator of all? Has not one God created us? Why then are we faithless to one another, profaning in the covenant of our fathers? Imagine that. How have we not all one father? So there's the question. Do you not have the father? Has not one God created? One God created. One. There's only one. One living God. And yes, we may all say, you know, Father, Father, Lord, Lord. But when we come here, we are faithless to one another. We don't love one another. And this is where the challenge is. And I'm not talking about one another here at church. I'm talking about one another outside of the church. Do we not love one another? And we're profaning the covenant of our fathers. Love one another. That's what the Word of God says. So let me ask you, are you loving one another? But truly, are you loving one another? It's hard, isn't it? It's a hard challenge. But God says that we are to do this because He loved us as well. So in the first part of the chapter 5, Paul is urging everyone to walk in the light as the sons of light. So when we go out into the street and live our lives, we are to be light to other people. So the challenge here is that all those things that we just read, all those things that we must be as a church or as a collective, or must have within us, it allows us, it gives us the opportunity to seize those opportunities. We need to be able to go out there and not waste time by reaching out to those in need. And those in need are those who don't know who God is, those who have not come to Christ. Those are those in need. But we need to question ourselves, have we been doing this? Have we? Have I in invited people to Christ more often? Or have I neglected the fact that God has asked me to share the gospel and I don't do it because I'm embarrassed. Or because where I work, I can't mention Christianity because, you know, I don't want to feel left out. Or because, frankly, if you say to someone, I'm a Christian, and they laugh at you because you don't act like a Christian. That's a tough one. That's why everywhere you go, you need to be identified as who you are as a Christian. But how sad is it for those Christians who say they're Christians, but they don't behave like Christians? That's why they don't seize opportunities, because no one believes them. Because what they say or who they say they are does not match their actions. For us to be able to seize opportunities, we need to be able to demonstrate it the way we live it. And I always like to say the fact that we need to live the gospel. Are you living the gospel? Or are you only talking it? Because one thing is to talk about it. Another thing is to live it. 
Now, have we stopped inviting people to church? You know, I would love to see everyone say, hey, I'm going to bring someone new. And you know that it only takes 46 characters from your phone. 46. Do you want to come to church with me? 46. Do you want to come to church with me? 46 characters. And that's all you got to do. You don't even have to talk to them. Send them a message. Do you want to come to church with me? And even if they say, no, I don't, it's okay. You pray for them. But you invite them. And it's not saying that you have to drag them. It says you invite them. And you invite them. But when you invite them and you see them, right, make sure that you live up to it. What's the point of saying, come to church with me, but I behave like someone that's a non-church goer or someone who is not really a Christian? Have we stopped sharing the gospel with other people? Do we not talk about what God has done in our lives? Remember what I said a while back, uh, months ago, when I said, share your story. Remember, share what God has done in your life. You don't have to talk about something, you know, so miraculously. Just say what God has done for you. You know, I was lost and now I'm found. And this is what he did for me. And this is what God is doing for me. Share your story. Have we been absorbed by worldly things? My job, I'm not saying this is bad, yeah? My job, my family. Uh, my school. I'm not saying these are bad things, but am I being absorbed by that? Is that all that, I, that there is to me? And I leave God's things aside. You know, you need to be able to, whatever you do and anything that you're doing, give it to God and give God the honor and glory. Give to Him. You know, we need to make sure that we understand that we are here for a reason. We're here for a purpose. And that purpose is to share the gospel. To live the gospel with people. That's why seizing opportunities at every doorstep. I want you to notice this from tomorrow or even from today. As you walk out of this place. Count how many opportunities you've had. To share, to invite, to live the gospel. And you haven't. It's an exercise throughout the week. Anyone you meet, oh, I could have invited them to church. And when you've done that, you've got the opportunity. If you didn't seize that opportunity, then you know what? Go back and do it. Hey, do you want to come to church with me? Or I go to church on Sundays. Oh, really? You know, it's initiate those conversations. You know, share your story with other people and what you're up to. And you will see what god does in your life you know but we're too busy and absorbed by a whole bunch of things perhaps have you noticed i'm not sure if you guys but you know you you're constantly watching your facebook and updates or or you or you're waiting for you know the, the latest catalogs to see so you can buy something that's cheaper or waiting for things to become cheaper at J, jv hi-fi or dfo you know and a lot of people spend a lot of time waiting for that why don't we focus the same way on God you know be anxious about you know oh that you can't wait to come to church and bring someone with you or, or you can't wait to to share the gospel with someone you can't wait to do we need to do the same thing but we're too busy and absorbed by other things but that's when the question the Holy Spirit should be telling you hey why don't you share your story why don't you share the gospel why don't you live the gospel why don't you you know, invite someone to church. Why aren't we doing it? You know, or, or for example, when you're, who buys an eBay here? Who buys, anybody buy an eBay? No. eBay is old news now. I think everyone's doing Shine and what are the other ones? Uh, um, you know, Alibaba and all this other stuff that you find online. We can buy it online and you can bid online. And have you noticed that people are waiting to outbid one another? You know, and they're looking at their phones and whatnot, waiting to be, outbid somebody else. But we should be the same way, yeah? The same way with our Christian life. You know, who do I invite now? Who do I talk to God about, you know? And, and 
It is so simple. But with, we, um, we disregard it. We're not as eager, we're not as interested in doing that as we're interested in something else. The Apostle Paul tells us that, you know, uh, we need to invest this kind of energy into God and God's things. That same energy that you have with eBay and, and, and you know, when you want to buy a car, you want to buy something new, that, that same eagerness should be about God. And that's where our generation at the moment is lost because we're not focused on the right needs. We're focused on the wrong needs. Now, Jesus tells us the following in the book of Matthew. He says, Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me and follow me and follow me. He didn't say look at me or stare at me or take a gander at me. He said, no, it's an active pursuit. Follow me. But are we following him? Or are we seeing him from the sidelines? Oh, there goes Jesus. There he goes. Look at that. That's where Jesus is over there. I love the way he walks. It's great. But we're doing it from far away. And when you follow someone, you're behind someone. You're perhaps imitating what they're doing. But we want to be Christians that look from far away. And that's why we're missing out on those seizing those opportunities. Because we want to be Christians from the sidelines. We don't want to be Christians in the field playing. For example, yesterday, um, Messi came to El Salvador to play um, with his current club against the national team. Mm -hmm. And everybody was there supporting, you know, and, and people wanted to run into the field because they wanted to engage, they wanted to be in the field. Why don't we engage with Christ in the field, not away from it? Not from the sidelines watching Jesus. And we love seeing Jesus and his miracles and what he's doing in other people's lives. And we say, wow, isn't that great what Jesus is doing for those people here? I wish I could. Well, jump into the field, my friend, and follow. Don't follow from the sidelines. Jump into the field and run and follow him and walk with him. <coughs> Matthew 4 says the following. It says, while walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately, 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 not yesterday, not today, not from the sidelines. Immediately they followed him. They left their nets, and they followed him, it says. And he continues, oh. And follow him. Make it count. Don't watch him from the sidelines. Make today count. And we need to do it from now, not from tomorrow. You know, we need we we don't have as much time as we think. How many people did not wake up this morning? How many people passed away yesterday? How many people thought they had everything going for themselves? I was told recently that one of my, one of my colleagues lost her husband just before Christmas. And they waved goodbye, see you, see you later. I'm off to work, yeah, me too. They never saw each other again. We don't have the time or the luxury that we think we have. That's why we need to start to follow today. Tomorrow is too late. It could also be someone that perhaps that we love and we never shared to them, hey, you know what? There's one person that loves you more than I and his name is Jesus and he died for you. Invite them. Point them to Christ. Because tomorrow it may be too late. For us. But it also may be too late for them. Because we never took the time. The opportunity. We never seized that opportunity. To share with Jesus. Yes. I want, I want you to understand. And emphasize on. How 
the important it is that you make it count. I love the song that we just, we just sang. You know, I don't want to leave a legacy. I don't care if they remember me because it's only about Jesus. But our job is to be able to share and make the day count on what you do. Orville Kelly, you may be wondering who he is. Well, Orville Kelly is the founder of an, organiza of an organization called Make the Day Count. Now, Kelly founded this organization after finding out that he had cancer himself. So he had cancer and it was a cancer that could not be cured. So there was no hope for him and he knew it. And the purpose of this organization said, well, you know what, I've got cancer, I know I'm going to die, but in the interim, I'm gonna make sure that every day counts and how, not by doing the things that he enjoys, but by sharing positive things with other people who have cancer and giving them the opportunity for them to make it count as well. Every day count. He stated before he passed away in the 1970s, he said the following, and I love this. He said, I do not consider myself dying of cancer, but living despite it. I do not look upon each day as another day closer to death, but as another day of life to be appreciated and enjoyed. And he goes on to say, and I have learned to live with cancer, not to die from it. So right now, we need to figure out the fact that we are day by day getting close to our expiry day. But we're, don't focus the fact that we're going to die. Focus on how you're going to make it count. How are you going to seize that opportunity in your life to share with the people that you love? So I may be, you, it may be a bit abstract when I say to you, invite someone to church or talk to someone about Jesus. But you know what? Think of the person you love the most. You got that in your mind? You know who you love the most? Yeah? Perfect. Think of them. Share with them the love of Jesus. Even if they don't want to talk to you. Tell me, you know what? I don't care if you don't want to talk to me. You know, I don't care if you don't remember me, as the song says. But you know what? Jesus loves you. Just remember that. Remember that. Remember that. Jesus loves you. Jesus wants to change your life. Tell the person you love the most. Because you know what? It may be that no one else tells them that. So make and seize that opportunity to tell them. And that is the attitude that we need to have. We need to have an attitude of make it count today. How many days have we wasted if we haven't shared God's word to anybody else? Or love somebody else? We need to stress the importance of the present. Not the past, but the present. Because we may not have a tomorrow. We may not have a tomorrow. We need to acknowledge, my friends, and this is when I finish up, we need to acknowledge that time is loaned to us to be used in God's service. So God has borrowed us this time to be used for him, to be used for him in his service, not mine or the church, but him. Are we doing this? Don't think that you have forever. You, well, you do have forever in eternity, but here on earth, you have a job and you need to make sure that you do it because we have a limited time to do so. Time is precious. And time is passing us by swiftly, but fast. We just celebrated Christmas and we're about to start Easter, you know, next month, uh, in a couple months. We're almost there. And then suddenly we're back in Christmas again. Time is flying. Time is uncertain. I don't know if I'm going to die today or tomorrow or next week. Hey, you don't know when you're so we don't have an we have an uncertainty of time. How long do we have? So make today count. Time, once is past, 
is gone and you cannot call it back. I wish I were 12, you know, and be at home and my parents worked and I would jump into the bed, into my room and play games and do nothing and have no responsibility. I cannot recall that time back. Time is something which we are also accountable for. What did you do? Because when God calls us, he'll ask us, how did you use your time? Oh Lord, you know, I was busy working. How did you use your time for me? Oh, I was too busy with my family. How did you use your time for me? You know, and, and you may think, or he may ask you, oh Lord, I was, I was busy, you know, with everything because I wanted something for my mom, for my dad and whatnot, what have you. Did you share me with your mom and dad? With your uncles and aunts, with your family, with the people you love? And God will say, you were placed on earth for a reason, for a purpose. And that purpose was to tell your family, to tell your loved ones, the people you care about, that I love them. And I was going to use you and you wasted your time and you did it. Oh Lord, but you know, maybe somebody else, I, I wanted you to do it. That was your purpose and you missed the opportunity. The other thing that we need to remember is that um, we need to make good use of time. And I think it's over understood. So as we leave here today, really ponder, if you take something with you today, you know, think about making good use of time. And I'm not saying come to church and be here in church, you know, like, like we're here like cockroaches. No, it's not that. Make good use of the time. Begin with your family. Your family is your first ministry. Your family, your mom, your dad, your kids, the people that you call family, they're your ministry. So, Today is ours, but if we procrastinate or leave things behind or ignore them or neglect them, we're going to lose the present. Don't lose your present. Make it count. One somebody once said, one today is worth two tomorrows. One to do it today. Don't wait. Do it today. Live as you were dying and make the most of it. So, as we finish, I want to ask you one question. One question. What time is it? What time is it to you? What time is it in your life? What are you going to do with time in your life? Well, let me tell you what time it is. It is a perfect time for you to open your heart to the good news of Jesus. And for those of you who are watching online, this goes for you as well. What time is it in your life? Well, let me tell you, it is a perfect time for you to let Jesus come to your heart. Or that you let him into your heart. It is time for you to put your faith in Jesus as Savior and Lord, as teacher, as friend. It also is a good time for those of us who have already taken this step to start doing what God has asked us to do, which is share the good news with other people. That's what time it is. And to make today count and don't lose that time. Time is precious. It is a time for us to talk to others about the love of God for every single one of us. Time to share the good news of salvation. It's also a time for us to be a joyful giver. But we've already had our offering. The giver of your own time and life to God. Give to God what it rightfully belongs to Him. And that is you. You belong to Him. 
So give yourself back to him, beginning with your heart, with your life, with your time, with your finances, with everything that you have belongs to him. So define your purpose in terms of being a contributor rather than helping merely being just a hearer. Do, don't just hear, but do. It is also a time to forgive those who have mistreated you, to forgive those who have deprived you perhaps. Now this is a particularly hard one, especially if you've been hurt. But God is saying it's okay. It's okay because I've got something bigger and better for you. I've got a bigger, better blessing for you this 2024. And you need to begin by seizing every opportunity that he gives you. And the first opportunity is come to Jesus. And the second, share Jesus. And your life will change. Your life will change. And others' lives will change as well. So this is my prayer this morning for you and your families. And those of you who are watching, that this 2024, you seize every opportunity that God has for you. Because it is time. It is time. May God bless you. We have one more song to pray. Lord, we ask you for your peace. We ask for your protection. We trust you, for you are constantly working on our behalf. We ask, Father, that you bring light, knowing that you expose the deeds of darkness and those who have sought to destroy us. We as a family standing together in your great and powerful name, believing that you are with us this year. We thank you, Father. May the Father's hand keep you from stumbling. The footprints of Jesus give you the strength and the confidence to follow. And the fire of the Holy Spirit keep you warm and safe in your walk with God. Today, tomorrow, and always. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May God bless you. See you next week. Um, stay for a cuppa. And for those of you who are coming with us to Kensington, uh, we'd love for you to join us. May God bless you. Say hello to one another. Thank you, everyone.